Welcome to Shaped by Cambridge. So excited to see you all here tonight. I'm Marika Van Dam, Executive Director of the Cambridge Historical Society. I am joined on the society side by Beth Folsom. She's our program manager, so you've seen her before. Hey, Beth. Um, she's just going to give a little very brief Zoom tutorial. Beth? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, so we are... Um, asking everyone to mute for the um, majority of the program, uh, just for ease of, you know, not having background sounds, but we um, want you to be included. You are the heart of our program, along with our special guest, um, Coach Jarvis. So please do drop your questions and comments um, in the chat for us, and we'll get to as many as we can before the end of the program. Um, we are asking for folks, um, you know, it's nice to keep your video on just so we can see who all is here. Um, if you want to turn it off, it's certainly um, available to you to do. Um, if we have a question or um, that we're asking or Marika's asking, um, you can go ahead and use the reactions button. If you have your video open, you can certainly just do a show of hands um, by that. But most of all, we want you to participate and have fun. So feel free to have um, some food or drink or whatever you want. Um, this, is, this is your night as well. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, Beth. So to test out your new Zoom skills, I'd love for everybody just in the chat box, drop a line where you're, where you're Zooming from. And if you have a CRLS affiliation, that would be really great to know about and if you wanted to share that. Um, and then if anybody felt uh, brave enough to talk about, so it, it's so funny, our last Shaped by Cambridge last week, um, we had a, a CRLS grad, uh, Zolan Cano Youngs, and he talked a lot about uh, CRLS and how great it was. Um, but it really got me thinking about high school and since we have coach here and his time here at CRLS and Cambridge in high school. So if anybody felt brave enough in the chat box to describe their recurring high school dream. Um, I will share mine. I can never find my locker. Drives me insane. I didn't play sports. Um, so for me, that's, that's the stressful part of um, always trying to find Scott Varenti because my last name is Van Dam, we're always next to each other, can never, in my dreams, can never find him so I can get my locker. So um, if anybody else wants to share that for the whole world to, to tease you about, feel free to share that. So um, let's see, our CL CRLS, we have, um, oh, oh, hey, Marty. Marty's daughters uh, went to CRLS and of course, Jen taught there, which is awesome, and your kids graduated, and <laughs> um, some good responses. I have a lot of folks from here in Cambridge, so glad to see everybody. Thank you, all over Cambridge, love to see that. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We're gonna have a great conversation tonight. So excited to have Coach Jarvis here. Um, this is, as, as I mentioned, this is our third event in Shaped by Cambridge. So we're talking to famous or infamous Cantabrigians about how the city has influenced them. Um, the other events, our past events, are on YouTube, as this one and our next one will be. And we are planning a second series. So if you know someone who you think should be featured here, please uh, let us know. And we'll try and get them. So before we begin, I did want to acknowledge that the places where the society works and gathers are the traditional land of the Massachusetts people. And if anybody wants to add in the, acknowledge, in the, uh, the chat box, wanted to acknowledge their, um, the land appropriate to where they are. So grateful to, to Coach Jarvis for joining us tonight. Also to all of you, our members and our supporters, because of your generosity, tonight's event is free and we're putting it up on YouTube. So thank you so much. I do want to thank our sponsors, IRB Real Estate, Cambridge Savings Bank, s and Construction, The Harder Group, Cambridge 7, and Cambridge Trust. So thank you to all of those folks. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's very special guest, Coach Mike Jarvis. Coach is a much celebrated athlete, coach, and educator, born and raised in Cambridge. 
Oh, I have to work on my screens here. Too many, I need a bigger screen. Born and raised in Cambridge, in high school, he played basketball for Ringe Tech. He later returned as a coach, working with future NBA players like Patrick Ewing uh, and former George Washington University head, head coach, Carl Hobbs. He graduated from Northeastern and went on to work for Boston University, George Washington University, St. John's University, and Florida Atlantic University. He's led his teams to over 300 wins and nine NCAA tournament appearances. So he's been busy. Uh, he's also a published author, and he may not identify as this, but he's a local history lover. And I'll tell you why I label him as such. I started reading his book, Everybody Needs a Head Coach, and he put it so well, I, I couldn't say it any better. So I'm just gonna quote it right now so we're all on the same page. Everybody has a story. You don't have to be a former basketball coach, a famous athlete, a celebrated entertainer, an award-winning musician, a decorated soldier, an accomplished politician, or a revered spiritual leader to have something interesting to share about your life. And everybody needs to tell his or her story. Don't let your history and your legacy get lost. Share your story, whether through written or oral dissertation, pass it down to the next generation. I hope you'll all welcome Coach Mike Jarvis. Yay. Yay. Well, listen, for, I just want to say um, thank you for the invitation. Um, and it's really great to be on um, with the members of my Cambridge family. And uh, I'm sure that during this time that we're going to spend together, you'll uh, get a pretty good idea of how much I, how fond I am of my, uh, uh, my life, my upbringing, uh, my education, my participation in the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge uh, community and Cambridge system. It's... Um, a gift from God, let me just say that, okay? Well, welcome. Um, so when I was reading your book and those, those lessons, those words just, they really jumped out at me, this idea of sharing your story and how important it is and your legacy and passing it down. So just curious, why did you write them and what history and what legacy do you think need to be recorded and shared? Well, you know, it's, I, I think most people during their lifetime, they say, you know, when I write my book, so most people, you know, talk about writing a book. And um, I, I was not the most avid reader in the world. And I'm sure some of my uh, former English teachers from, uh, from Ringe would probably be amazed that I would even dare put my name on a book. But I, you know, the more and more uh, time went by, the more and more I realized how blessed I had been, how fortunate I had been, first of all, to be born, educated and raised in Cambridge and to have the, had the experiences that I had uh, in Cambridge and then when I started moving around as a college coach. And not all the experiences were, um, you know, were winning ones. Uh, I made a little ton of mistakes along the way and, you know, one of the things that, you know, one of the many things that uh, I've been taught over the years and things that I remember, in fact, I remembered, um, you know, one of my coaches uh, implanted in me the, the concept that the only time you lose is when you don't learn. And so I, I, felt, I feel like I've learned a lot of lessons, a lot of life lessons, um, uh, many of them good. Many of them not so good. I made a lot of mistakes, and I, I really believe that I'm supposed to. When I when when my time comes to to say goodbye to this to this side, then I'm I'd like to hope that maybe I could leave something that, starting with my own kids and my own grandchildren, that they could look back at, read, reflect upon, maybe avoid making some of the same mistakes. Um, that I made, maybe do some of the same things that I did that worked out well, but but, but basically have even a better life. And uh, just like, you know, all of our parents want us to have a better life than they had, I, I want anybody or everybody that I can to have a better life and a more meaningful life than I have had. So that's sort of like the inspiration. And then the other thing is my faith. You know, I was born again, saved, became a uh, bona fide certified Christian at the age of 60. And um, 
So I, I really feel like, you know, any opportunity I get to share uh, my faith, not trying, not with the idea of trying to convert anybody, but just trying to uh, let everybody know how, how grateful I am um, for the blessings that God has given me and the gifts that he has given me. And, you know, and just like everybody has a story, everybody has gifts, everybody has special talents. And it's up to us to find out what they are, uh, to use, to try to practice at using them and then to share them with as many people as we can. So that's, that's my long answer to that short question. Coach, have you always been so positive and uh, wonderful to converse with? I, I can't, I, you're not, I, I never played sports. I'm not a sports person, but I, I envision coaches like yelling at you from the sidelines and kind of like being mean and, and you don't well, strike me as that kind of person. Oh yeah. Well, let me just tell you about, uh, and Vinny could probably tell you about, uh, he could probably talk more about that side of me, but that, that certainly is a side of me, a side of me that many times I, you know, after a game or after a season, I would look back and say, you know, you, you got to do better. And uh, if I was to go back to coaching, I would try to do better. But, you know, I think inside of each and every one of us are many different people. We have many different personalities hanging out inside of us. So I've got a, I know I've got a, a loving, kind side in, in, in of me. And I also know I've got a, I, I've got that other, that other devil just waiting to come out. And um, my mother, I would, I would always try to have my mother sit uh, behind our team bench so she couldn't read her son's lips during the game because there were there were times in my coaching career when my mouth was awful and uh, you know she would say Michael what were you saying to those officials and I couldn't tell her because she wouldn't believe me because I was her wonderful little boy so she she wouldn't have believed it if I told her so uh, you know th like I said you'll You'll see a side of me, and I'm sure there are some players that would say I was a wonderful, loving, kind, gentle coach. And then there are other players that would have probably liked to blow up my car after some of the games when I got on them. But uh, so, you know, I've got a lot of different sides to me, just like everybody on this call does, I'm sure. That's fair. Well, um, tell us, give us some, uh, some background information about your time in Cambridge. Where did you live? Okay. Places okay. you hung out? Tell us. You know, I, I was fortunate. I grew up in the area of Cambridge they call the coast. Um, you know, that was the nickname that our community had, the coast down uh, Western Ave, uh, Howard Street. I was born. Uh, my first house was on Calendar Street in Cambridge. Uh, I, 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 we had two different residents. I moved from, uh, we moved out of, out of one house at 68 Howard Street basically out of the side windows of our first floor apartment into the duplex, which was next door at 64 Howard Street. So I had a couple of residents in Howard Street. Uh, from Howard Street, we moved to uh, River Street where I met my high school sweetheart and, and soon to be wife. And then um, when we got married, uh, we went, um, uh, we, uh, we, our first home was on Canard Street and then we moved to North Cambridge and lived on George Street, and uh, that. Uh, and then we lived in the Walden Mews. So, you know, uh, those were the different places that I lived in Cambridge. Every one of them, uh, I can on honestly say, I have got fond, fond memories. And the thing I loved about growing up in Cambridge, and I often tell people, you know, when they talk about all the problems that are going on in the world, particularly the racial problems and all the unrest and all the stuff that's going on. And I say, you know, I can't really talk from that perspective. I know that I've got brown skin. Um, you know, it's a little browner now that I live in Florida than it used to be. But the bottom line as an African-American, I grew up in a city where, you know, there was, it was almost, it was almost too good, I guess. It was sort of like a little bit of utopia. I mean, we didn't have, you could go to any, any neighborhood in the city, um, you know, and feel comfortable. Um, you know, whether you were in, uh, down the coast or you were at, at the, up at the, in the port, you know, up by Central Square or in North Cambridge or East Cambridge. And we had friends everywhere. And then when I got into teaching at the high school, I mean, I basically, you know, taught kids from all over the city. And uh, it was just a, a great place to grow up, uh, uh, you know, a real community. 
um, in the neighborhood I grew up in. Um, you know, you walked everywhere. You didn't have to worry about being transported anywhere. You could walk uh, to, uh, you walk to school. Like I'd walk up the, you know, up to the Houghton Grammar School, which became the King School, um, and go in there with all the other poor kids in the neighborhood. We didn't know that we were poor because we got fed every day and we had clean clothes. Um, you know, we played ball around the corner. I, I mean, on, the, on Howard Street was the Cambridge Community Center where I was uh, taught how to play sports, uh, basketball by a guy by the name of Stretch Headley. Um, in fact, um, um, uh, what is, um, oh geez, Sandra Graham. Uh, Graham's dad, Stretch, was the Lily coach. He was my Lily coach, so we played Lily ball there. And then you go around the corner to Hoyt Field, where you'd play baseball. Uh, the Mission, where you'd play basketball in the evening. Um, I mean, so, you know, you, you basically, I mean, everything that you needed, your school, your home, your community centers, everything was within walking distance. And you got everybody, you got to know everybody, everybody got to know you. Um, you know, many a time, I mean, when I, when I did things that I shouldn't have done before I got home, my mother knew it because somebody would call and say, Hey, I just saw, you know, little Mike, you know, around the corner doing this or that. So before you got home, your mom knew. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, a you know, you talk about a, it takes a village, you know, to raise a child. Well, that's what Cambridge was like. And, uh, you know, I, I guess, I mean, I, I can't, on, I couldn't put a, the bad experiences in Cambridge on one hand. I mean, that's how great Cambridge was to me, for me, and my family. Loved, loved every minute that we lived in Cambridge. How long were you there? When did you tell well, it? Give us a little bit of, a little okay. bit of timeline. Well, you know, I, like I said, I went to the Houghton Grammar School, went to Ringe Technical High School because we felt back then that the real men went to Ringe Tech, and the guys, uh, the other ones went to Cambridge High in Latin. So I went to Ringe Tech. Of course, we all hung out uh, when we could at the Cambridge, uh, at the library. That's where a lot of, you know, relationships were formed. Uh, you know, I, I, I took a typing class at, the, at, at High in Latin just so I could uh, go over and see the ladies once in a while. But um, so, you know, you, I, I, I went to high school at, at Ringe. And then um, when I got through uh, with the high school at Ringe, I went to Northeast, I actually went to Chamberlain Junior College for a year uh, to improve my SAT scores and then went to Northeastern uh, University uh, for five years in the co-op program. And then was fortunate enough to get hired at, uh, at uh, Ringe Tech as a phys ed teacher. Um, and um, then went on from there to, to Boston U, GW, St. John's, FAU. But, uh, Everything started in Cambridge, and um, you know, I, I had a I had a dream. You talk about dreams. I had a dream that I would go back someday to, to Cambridge, and I would coach uh, the high school basketball team again, and they would end up carrying me off the court after our last state championship. And maybe I don't know if Vinny was 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 carrying me with one of the guys carrying me off the court or not, but uh, you know, I've had that dream a couple of times. So interesting. To, so last week we had, um, as I mentioned, uh, Zolan, he's a, a recent grad of CRLS, just talking about how, how much he valued the diversity of the school. And he's a journalist now. And he, he considers himself a, a good journalist because he understands empathy. And he got the empathy by just having the and seeing the experiences of all of his classmates. And I just, anyone affiliated with CRLS, I just love for any comments or on that to come through, um, if that was a similar experience that you had. And as we wait for that, I'm just, uh, it's, I don't know how often you come back. You must have a sense of how the city is changing. Do you still have friends here and, and family? Do they talk about that? Do you have a sense of that? Well, you know, uh, whenever I get really lonely, I call Vinny up and say, hey, Vinny, what are you doing? And uh, so I, I still got uh, friends. Uh, I don't have, I've got, cousins that live in Cambridge, but I don't have brothers and sisters anymore in Cambridge. And my mom, uh, you know, who lived in Cambridge, uh, ended up uh, in Maryland with my sister. So I don't have, um, you know, my close, uh, I've got a brother who lives down the Cape, my brother Steve, 
uh, lives down the Cape. And, um, but, you know, I uh, and a few nephews living in around, outside of Cambridge. I don't have any real family left in Cambridge. I've got a lot of, I still got some very good friends who are in Cambridge. So when we, when I go back uh, to the city, I try to, you know, reconnect with them. And obviously whenever that happens, you, you know, you take a ride back down memory lane and we talk about the good old days at the high school and about some of the, you know, the games that we, we, we participated in and some of the experiences we had. And, uh, you know, so like I said, you know, I married my, my high school sweetheart um, who went to high in Latin. Um, her maiden name was Gordon, uh, Cornelia Ann Gordon uh, became, uh, you know, Connie Jarvis. And uh, we got married um, in 1967. I'm trying to, 67, 60, 67. And uh, so we just celebrated our 53rd anniversary. And uh, if I'm so blessed, we'll be having another one uh, sooner than later. In fact, the last time I was together with my family in Washington, D.C., because my daughter lives in Maryland and my sister lives in Maryland, and we were in the D.C., Maryland area, was for my wife's uh, birthday in February. And uh, that was just before the, uh, the pandemic took over our life. And uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. If, I mean, we haven't hardly been out of the house since then. And my wife's just driving her crazy. So I'm hoping that before the, her next birthday, we can get out, we, get, we can get together with the family again. Did your, did your experience similar to you did, that you had here in Cambridge? You know, when I listen to them talk about their, their life as Canterbridgeans, their experiences in school, um, whether it was at, um, you know, the, the elementary school, my son, Mike, after he got kicked out of the, um, out of St. John's out of the Catholic school, they threw, they, they booted him out. So he went to the Fitzy and, uh, my daughter stayed at, um, St. John's and, uh, but they talk about their days in Cambridge, I think very similar to, to mine. And, and like I said, it's great that we had such a great childhood, all of us. And we have got such great fond memories. The only problem sometimes is it's very difficult for me to be able to totally understand what some of the young people today have experienced. Because honestly, so many of the things that I hear people talking about that they've experienced as black uh, men and women, uh, I, I mean, honestly, I didn't. I think the first time I heard the N-word uh, and I was called, um, uh, you know, called, called, called the name, I think I was riding my bicycle through Somerville. I mean, and for all the time that we played in Cambridge and all the time that, you know, we competed, I mean, it, it was, it, it, it never got around to black versus white. It was just, it might've been neighborhood versus neighborhood or, you know, like when we were in grammar school, uh, the, the different districts, like I was in at, at the Houghton school, we were the, the reds and then there was the blues and the purples and the greens and, so, I mean, you, you know, you, you, you identified yourself many times by your neighborhood or by the color of your school, but not by the color of your skin. So, um, and, you know, as far as, uh, like, I was talking with someone not too long ago about probably what's the biggest difference in growing up was, is that, you know, we grew up at a time when we were taught to respect our elders. We were taught to respect authority. We were taught... Um, in fact, I, I would get a, I'd get a, a, a dirty look if I referred to our policemen as cops. I mean, that's how different time has come, uh, how, how things have changed. I mean, you know, and some of my best friends, you know, um, went on to become policemen in Cambridge. In fact, uh, uh, Larry Stead, who was the leader of my basketball team, in fact, his nickname was Leader, and. Um, uh, he, you know, he served on the police force until he retired. And, uh, you know, as did uh, Ruben Dotton and a lot of the other guys that I went to school with. And some of my players, you know, went on to become policemen and firemen and, and um, you know, incredibly respected um, professions. And I just, sometimes it, I just, it amazes me how far backwards we have gone in certain areas, you know, whether it be, you know, how we treat one another, how we speak to one another, the respect that we either do or don't have for, for you know, the people who are, 
you know, serving us and protecting us and, you know, there for us. So, you know, I, that, that's something that, you know, I don't know how it is now in Cambridge, but I know at one time, boy, you, you know, you, you, you better speak, you better, you better watch your manners in terms of how you speak to your teachers and, you know, and how you spoke to your coaches and your, and, you know, policemen and, and so forth and so on. So it's interesting to hear you say that it was a bit of a bubble um, when you were uh, here growing up here in Cambridge. And so I'm wondering when you left the city, did, did you see a difference? Did you notice a difference? Did you feel a difference, say well, you know, in Boston? Yeah, I, I did. But at the same time, because I grew up in Cambridge and because, you know, we were I, there were certain things that were I, uh, instilled in us. In fact, I, in, my, in, in my last book, The Seven Seas of Leadership, I talk about, um, we picked seven, seven words, seven uh, fundamental principles that begin with the letter C. And the first two um, were really grounded and rooted and really developed in Cambridge, and that was confidence. Uh, we were growing up to be very confident individuals, um, you know, believing that, you know, anything was possible and that we could try to be anything. And that, that started at home with my mom and my sister and my brother. Um, and then, you know, they instilled courage in us um, by the, the, the affirmative words that they spoke to us, by the way they communicated to us. So, you know, I speak of confidence, courage, communication. Those are three of the C's. And those three, I can honestly say that when I think about being raised, born, you know, being having been born and raised in Cambridge, I got to give Cambridge and the people that, that, you know, that taught me and mentored me and loved on me, um, they instilled those, those things in me. So no matter where we went, uh, my wife felt the same way. Um, you know, we would never we would never let ourselves be intimidated by a, a place. I mean, we felt like, you know what, we own this place. We're going out in this place. We're going to, you know, we're going to walk with pride, with Cambridge pride. We're going to look people right in the eyes when we speak to them. They're going to know that we're not intimidated. They're going to know that we're not afraid of them or anything else. And we're going to just move forward. And uh, that's what, you know, we tried to do. And I know Vinny will tell you that's what we tried to teach our kids to do. I mean, we wanted our kids to be really proud of being, you know, a part of the Cambridge team and Cambridge family, but also be humble at the same time. And, um, you know, because I think you can be both. So what brought your family to Cambridge? You know, probably uh, the same thing that brought the Ewing family and a whole lot of other families, the, the fact that it was a, it was a, a, a warm and friendly in, environment where, where folks, particularly folks who didn't come from a whole lot, could go, uh, you know, not only find a place to live that they could afford back then, uh, and, um, you know, and, and get a job and, uh, and feel like, you know what, they've got friends and family looking out for them. So like I said, the neighborhood we grew up in, you know, I mean, there would be parties and, um, you know, uh, if there was a birthday, you know, you'd half the, half the neighborhood would be at the birthday party. Um, and so people really, you know, loved on one another and they, 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 they hung, to get, hung out together, they partied together, they, I'm sure they, they went and had drinks together, and they probably cried together. But um, you know, we did we did what we did we did what we did, uh, you know, as a community, as a as a big family. It's just I, I'm seeing Lauren's comment in the chat. She's she says so wonderful to hear that the Cambridge I know for our kids is similar to what you experienced. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, you know, I can just hope and pray that 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 young people growing up, regardless of where they grow up we'll be able to have some of those same feelings that I had growing up in Cambridge. So if you were to take us all on a special tour of Coaches Cambridge, where would you take us? If I took you on a tour, I'd probably take you on a similar tour that I took uh, ESPN on uh, when they did a, a two hour uh, show documentary called The Season back in when I was at St. John's. I, 
I would take you to the high school, obviously. I, but I, before that, I'd take you back through my neighborhood. I'd take you for a walk down Howard Street and around to the community center in Hoyfield and uh, up the hill to, to the Houghton School. I'd take you basically through, you know, Central Square, Harvard Square. Uh, I certainly would show you where Harvard and MIT were. Uh, I'd take you to North Cambridge and show you my little George Street that you know, I, I don't know, I, I didn't think it was big enough for one car to get down, but, um, you know, uh, but that's all we had to worry about was getting one car down that street at a time. And uh, so I would take you basically on a, on a tour that would take you through all those different parts of Cambridge, showing you the diversity of the city and, you know, just how, you know, how uh, even though, you know, we, we didn't know we were poor, but how poor people, you know, could survive and live um, you know, in, in, the, in the neighborhood. And I'd want you to know where I was educated. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the coaches I had and some of the people that taught me about life and uh, some of the experiences that I had, good, bad, and indifferent. And um, I'd also take you by the, the churches that I attended. Um, you know, my wife went to St. Paul's AME Church in Central Square. I went to St. Paul's Catholic Church near Harvard Square. We got married uh, in both churches. Um, and uh, so I'd probably take you by the, the two, um, you know, the two St. Paul's uh, churches that had an influence on our life. And I certainly, certainly would take you by uh, River Street, 133, 135. 133 was where, I, uh, where, 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 um, uh, where Connie lived and 135 was where I lived. And, our houses were separated by about uh, 15, maybe uh, 15 feet separated our houses. Um, and uh, my mother would say, well, you know what, get off the phone, just open the window and talk to her. We get off the phone. And uh, that's how close we lived to each other. And, uh, you know, we went to each other's proms and uh, eventually, uh, like I said, we, we got married and, um, you know, raised a family uh, in Cambridge and had a, like I said, I had a great life in, in Cambridge. And when I left Cambridge after teaching uh, phys ed for 17 years and coaching at the high school, um, you know, folks couldn't understand how I could leave, but it was time. The good Lord was saying, it's time for you to, you know, to, to venture out and, you know, take a shot at maybe the college life and see what happens. There are a couple of questions that came through on the chat. Do you have a favorite part of Cambridge and what place do you miss the most? Uh, favorite part of Cambridge, um, probably, you know, it, it's probably the years that our kids were growing up on George Street in North Cambridge. Um, you know, it was, it was at a time when, you know, they'd go out to play uh, right after dinner time and they would stay out until they heard their name called to come in when it was starting to get dark. And you know, the neighborhood, I mean, every, every race, every religion, every, any, everybody. I mean, it were whites, blacks, uh, Chinese. There was everything in, 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 in that neighborhood. And the kids got along so well. And, you know, those were the days also when the kids could come home and, and you know, you could just leave the back door unlocked and they could come in the house and you didn't have to worry about them being kidnapped or, you know, or molested or what have you. But... Um, you know, I'd say North Cambridge because that's when my, my little guys were, you know, becoming bigger guys. That's when they were going from grammar school uh, to high school. And when, you know, we would, I, I would go and play catch with my son on George Street or take him to the ball field or go watch my daughter perform in recitals and, uh, you know, uh, drama, uh, at the drama uh, uh, things. and. You know, we just did every, we did, we had, we were, I was coaching at the high school. We were winning. People were loving, at least the Cambridge uh, people were loving the team. And um, we were on top of the world. And so that was a great time. And that probably was my, my best years and my most memorable years in Cambridge during uh, when we were on George Street. So I just want to switch gears a little bit. Um, Patrick Ewing is, you know, a famous Cantabrigian, uh, yes. who's a friend of yours uh, and uh, a mentee of yours. He did get this, the, uh, the key to the city of Cambridge in 1984. Uh, yeah. Were you there for that? 
I was. In fact, I was invited to give the, um, uh, it was it was probably more of a eulogy, <laughs> but I was I was asked to give the, the uh, to talk to the high school that day, and I did. And uh, they had just uh, I think it was right after the Olympics, after they won the gold, and um, Patrick was was honored and appropriately so, and uh, he came back, and I I was able to talk about him as a person, and about his time, uh, and how he got introduced to basketball and the the impact that he had not only on Cambridge but on the high school but Cambridge and basically basketball nationally i mean he put high school came he put massachusetts basketball i mean on the map and uh what he did during his time in high school has never been duplicated and probably won't be i mean he if we played in a in a in the Boston Garden and the Boston Garden back then, the, the magic number was thirteen nine oh nine. That that was the capacity. And when we played in the Boston Garden, there were more than thirteen thousand nine hundred and nine people, trust me. And Vinny can mm -hmm. attest to this. I mean, they were people they, they didn't have enough seats for the people. They would sit they would be sitting in the aisles watching Patrick Ewing play basketball. That's how dominant and how just a compelling player he was. Well, I wasn't here in Cambridge at that time, so I'd love if anybody has any memories to pop them in the chat, just to be, you know, a, to, Cambridge is a small town, right? We're, we're next, to, uh, next to Boston, but um, it's still just a very, very small town, so I can imagine that um, the, the pride everyone must have experienced was pretty Oh, incredible. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, during the three years that Vinny was with me, um, you know, we, um, we lost one game um, with Patrick. Uh, of course, the, the gentleman who, uh, my pastor in, in, in Boca, he said, you know, you, you know how, how could you be a really good coach if you lost a game with Patrick? And so one day I says, Rev, let me tell you what happened. And I told him, I says, you know, one night we took a bus ride and Vinny, I, I think you were on this trip with us. We went to Connecticut to play Wilbur Cross, who was the state champs in Connecticut. And it was a brutal snowstorm. We probably shouldn't have gone to play the game. And, uh, but we went and Patrick was sick that, that day. In fact, um, I had the uh, trainer, Tom Curtin, uh, oh, the great, great Tom Curtin. Um, he, I had him bring a bag of t-shirts, uh, practice t-shirts with us on the trip because about every five minutes, Patrick would take off a, a, a drenched, a soaked uh, soak t-shirt and throw it on the floor and put on a dry t-shirt. So all night long, he's changing into a dry t-shirt. And Somehow, we, he got through the game. He probably shouldn't have played, but he was such a warrior that he, there was no way he wasn't going to play. We lost that game. It was the only game we lost in three years. And um, But that also was the night when the t-shirt uh, phenomenon craze was, was born because uh, when he went to Georgetown, he had gotten so used to wearing a t-shirt under his game uniform he wore a t-shirt and John Thompson being the businessman that he was made a deal with Nike. And so Nike put their swoosh on the sleeve of the t-shirts. And before you know it, every, almost every kid in the United States was wearing a t-shirt under their game shirt and John Thompson's getting rich. And um, so Patrick, you know, that night's when the t-shirt craze was born. A lot of people, you know, wouldn't have, would have no idea how, you know, players started wearing t-shirts, but it started in, in Connecticut on a snowy night by a young man by the name of Patrick Ewing who played for the Cambridge Fringe and Latin Warriors. You heard it here, folks. That's um, right. So um, I'm just looking at the chat and um, Marty says he actually has this nice memory. I recall Patrick leading the team onto the court with his famous scowl. The other team had lost during that warm up because they were intimidated by him. And Marty actually has another question. He says, I'm surprised to learn that you didn't encounter any racism growing up in Cambridge. I wonder if you could comment on the terrible racism that Patrick Ewing faced when he played at Georgetown. Well, you know, when, when, when I say, I mean, I'm talking about, when I talked about racism, it, it was relating basically to my childhood. When Patrick was playing in at Far Cambridge, there was a tremendous amount of, of anger and racism that was, was geared towards him and toward the team, myself and the team. Uh, and it was made, it, it had to do with the fact that we were just so daggone good. And we were so fundamentally sound. I mean, we wouldn't just beat you on the scoreboard. We'd beat you in every single way. I mean, we would outplay you 
offensively, defensively, strategically, you name it. We were just, we were fundamentally that good and we were that, and we were talented to go along with it. So people did not like us very much because they knew that there was a pretty good chance they were going to end up losing the game. So, you know, the, the only way that a lot of people could try to get to us was by getting on us. And yes, they, they would, they would, there were comments made uh, that I, I mean, I, I, I thank God I, I didn't hear half of them. Uh, bananas were thrown on the court. Folks came dressed in gorilla suits. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. And when, and when Patrick committed to go to Georgetown and did and, and not uh, Boston College, um, you know, fans started chanting, you know, Ewing can't read. So they tried to get under his skin that way. Um, but you know, like I said, it was it was mainly it, it, it was more jealousy than it was racism. I mean, you know, they used race was the way that, that the, you know the, the the way in which they tried to uh, uh, take out their frustrations and anger. But it was it was really it had more to do with them just being jealous of of what we who we were, where we came from, and the fact that we did what we did as well as we did it. So somewhat related, um, sports are often, people try to see them as neutral. And yeah. um, we, we see them, you know, athletes today and throughout history uh, have used their time in the spotlight to attract attention to social issues. Is that something that you saw, either you participated in or any of your um, players take part in? Yeah, there were different times, you know, during my coaching career when, um, you know, uh, for example, when I was at George Washington back in the 90s, um, I'm sorry, in the 80s, um, you know, there was a lot of racial uh, tension back then. And there was a, you know, there were the black coaches were trying to get opportunities because there weren't many opportunities for African Americans, uh, other than playing, uh, when I first went to college to coach at Boston University um, as a head coach, that there were eight, um, a total of eight Division One black head coaches in America, and that um, other than the predominantly black colleges, so there weren't many opportunities. I mean, you you know, you had to be really blessed, you had to be good, you had to be blessed, you had to be in the right place at the right time. And normally when we got jobs, we got jobs that were, you know, at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, you know, programs that just had had terrible success or no success at all. So we got a chance. In fact, when I left, when I went from Boston University to George Washington, um, you know, I took over a team there that had won one game the year before. And those are the kinds of opportunities that, uh, you know, young black coaches were getting back then. It got better for a while. It, it sort of regressed a lot lately, but um, it wasn't, it wasn't easy, you know, to try and, you know, uh, get, make, make a, make a play, get a place in, in the coaching uh, the field. Um, and I, and like I said, when I was at, at George Washington in the eighties, there was a lot of, um, in fact, they, at one point in time, the college coaches uh, were contemplating boycotting uh, games, uh, college basketball games. It didn't happen. And it, maybe it should have because maybe things would have gotten a lot better a lot sooner. But, um, but anyhow, there were, there, were, there were times. My, my, my whole thing with, with, the, you know, with, with players, coaches, or any of us, you know, um, and I think everybody's got to, got a right to, to say what, what's on their mind, has a right to express their opinion, whether an athlete or not. I know some people would say, you know, just play. You know, you're, you're paid to, be, to perform. But you know what? You're also part of this world we live in, so you have a right to, to express your opinions. My only, my only thing is I wish some of the same people that, you know, take, that will stand up and, you know, take a stand you know, in front of the camera and talk, you know, a good talk would, would basically maybe take some of the money and put it into maybe, you know, improving education and some other things that uh, would really make a difference. So that, that's my only thing is, you know, I, uh, if, you, if you go all the way, you know, don't just go halfway. 
So it's very exciting to me that you, you've spent your career coaching student athletes at high school and college level. Um, what has this taught you about young people and their capacity to make change? Are you hopeful? Do you, do you feel good about the future? I'm hopeful. I'm also fearful. Um, you know, uh, you know, it seems like, you know, we take a step forward, we take a two steps back, we take a couple of steps forward, we take three steps back. So I'm hopeful uh, because I, you know, I, I, I believe in, in the country that uh, I was born in. I, this is the greatest country that, in, that God ever created. Um, you know, it was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Um, you know, our founding fathers, I think they got most of it right, if not all of, pretty much all of it right. And I just, uh, you know, at the same time, I wish we could, could go back a little bit in time and bring back, you know, some of the, you know, the, the respect that we, we've allowed to, to you know, to, to leave. And, and just back to some of the basic fundamentals that I think everybody in this phone call was raised on and that we would just really, you know, try to love, you know, um, our fellow man as God loves us. And uh, if we could do that, boy, you know, it, it would be everything that all of us want it to be, I think. So we, we do have a question in the chat from Emma. Emma, I'm okay. wondering if you could unmute. Is that, is that this young lady that's sitting, uh, that's at the bottom of my screen? Hi, Emma. Hi, yeah, I'm Emma. So I'm a basketball player. I'm in middle school. And oh, okay. I was just wondering that, like, I mean, I'm still learning. I'm not, like, I'm still, like, growing my skills. I was just wondering if you were to give any tips to, like, young players like me, what would you yeah. say? Oh, I, I tell you what. Here's what I would, I would say to you, just like I, you know, uh, uh, I was told a long time ago that in order to be good at anything, first of all, You've got to, you know, it's going to take a lot of work. And I'm sure you, have, you you put a lot of time and a lot of effort in. So I would say that, you know, try to really uh, think about what you're going to do. Develop a plan and then try to work that plan to the very best of your ability. Um, and remember that, you know, you're only going to be as good as the fundamentals that you have. So while maybe your friends are working on all kinds of fancy, you know, exciting moves, try to be as fundamentally sound as you can be. And that probably the best advice I could give you is try to ask yourself, what, do, what am I really, what do I do really, really well? What do I do best? What am I best at? Am I best at rebounding? Am I best at shooting? Am I best at pass? Whatever you're best at, try to become even better at that. Try to be the best at whatever you can be, whatever your best is, try to make it even better. Work really exaggerate, really work on your strengths and try to, you know, uh, perfect your strengths. Um, a lot of people so spend so much time working on their weaknesses that they just become average in everything, you know. And um, I heard a, 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 I got a word the other day. I was watching a, a church sermon. And the fellow was saying, you know, um, you gotta you, you gotta figure out what what your purpose is in life, uh, and figure out what you do, what you do best, and just look at it like like you got you got two chairs in front of you, you know, you you got and, and sit and pick one of those chairs. So pick that skill, that set, that 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 that, that thing that you do really well and really concentrate on sitting in that chair as, as, as opposed to some people, you know, my, and I've done this too often, you try to sit in two or three chairs at the same time and you end up sitting in no chair, you end up sitting in the middle, you know, somewhere in the middle. So you never end up perfecting anything. So I'd say really try to define what it is that you do best and then try to do that even better. That's what I would say. Thank you so much for doing that. that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I hope so. You know, uh, my friend, Coach Millie, he was a really, and I, and I keep going back to him because I'm so happy to see him. But um, 
one of the things that 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 he did, and and I think he helped me do better, was to really try to keep it simple, and really really, um, you know, uh, concentrate on those those little things, those fundamentals that could that really make a difference. And the greatest players that I've coached, the greatest players I've coached against, were also the most fundamental. And um, you know. Uh, like some people, I, if you're a basketball person, you may have heard, you probably have heard the name Dr. J, Julius Irving, one of the most flamboyant, greatest players who ever played the game of basketball. He played at the University of Massachusetts. He played at a time when dunking was not allowed. And Dr. J had a great coach by the name of Jack Lehman. And Jack Lehman was one of the most fundamental coaches that you ever want to meet. And he made sure that Dr. J's fundamentals were, I mean, off the chart. They were so good. And so when the day came when Dr. J, Emma, could do the fancy stuff, it was even easier for him to do it because he had a great base. He had a great found, fundamental foundation. Everything goes back to your foundation, goes back to your, to your base. Thank you. So thanks for asking that question, Emma. Where, where do you go to school? I go to school at Belmont Day School. Also, I, she doesn't have her camera on, but Eliza at the bottom. She's one of my friends, and she also plays basketball with me. Hi, hey, Eliza. Yeah. What kind of team? What kind of team do you have? Um, I I play for Huskies, a uh, club basketball team. Um, that's around Massachusetts. Okay. Like in the kind of Woob Woburn, West, like West yeah. Lincoln area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Did you ever hear a shoot straight? Did you? Well, a long time ago, Vinny helped me with this too. We started a program, a youth basketball program in Cambridge. Uh, uh, myself and a fellow by the name of Joe Colonino, a fellow teacher. Uh, in fact, the first program we, we ever ran was in Woburn. And it was a youth basketball program, co-ed program, uh, boys and girls starting in the third grade. Uh, we used smaller basketballs, um, lower hoops, and the emphasis was on teamwork, fundamentals, and sportsmanship. And we did, We had one of the best youth basketball programs in the country. And in fact, I think Lance Doughton, who's now the coach at the high school, I think he's still running the shoot straight program in Cambridge. But that was our feeder program. And all of our kids came up through the shoot straight program. And when they came to the high school, they, were, they had a really great, solid, fundamental foundation. And that helped us win a lot of games and a lot of championships. That's really cool. Yeah, it is. And I'm proud, proud to talk about it, as you can tell. And Marty, I remember seeing that face of yours at our games. Now, you played a little ball yourself, didn't you? No? OK, I don't know why. OK, all right. <laughs> No, just, just a big, a huge fan for decades. Um, it, it's an honor to be in this virtual uh, presence with you, but I, I've been going to Ringe basketball games for many decades. Yeah, I remember seeing you. I, you know, when I saw your face, I said, I know that guy. I've seen him. I've seen him at games. So thanks for being on. <laughs> So coach, we're getting to the end of our time, which is kind of amazing. It's, a, it, it's flown by. I feel like we could talk forever, but I guess one of my questions, it, remaining questions is, do you have another book in you? And what might that be about? I don't know. You know what? Um, I probably do. Um, and if I, if I do one more book, it's probably going to be about... Um, I'm probably going to concentrate on one of the C's that I did a very poor job at, and that was cash, handling money. Um, and uh, so that will probably be my next book that I want to pass on to my grandchildren. So they do a better job uh, saving, spending, investing, and, 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 and don't do like their grandfather. In other words, I thought, honestly, I, if I had known I was going to live – to be 75 and feel like I'm 55 with 20 more years, I would have done a lot better with my money, trust me. So I got one more book left in me and it's probably going to deal with cash, you know, the seven C's and then cash. Um, and uh, so anyhow, um, but 
but what I hope uh, that I'm going to be able to do, um, you know, for the next whatever amount of years that God allows me is to be able to share what I do know, uh, what I already have put uh, on, put in, in books form uh, with young and old people alike. Um, you know, it's funny, I, as much as I enjoy young people, I enjoy talking to their parents probably even more to them because those are, they're the coaches, the parents, uh, you know, the, and, and, and many times when I start talking about some of my experiences, you know, there were a lot more heads nodding by the older folks than the younger folks. So I, I really enjoy talking with parents and with grandparents. And so I'll, I'll try to see if, if there's another book in me, it'll be a book that'll be really geared to parents and grandparents more so than to kids. All right, you like that, Beth? Amy, you with me on that? Okay, all right. I'm with you. Okay. It's so, such an absolute pleasure getting to know you and just this little snippet and seeing Cambridge through your eyes. It's just been really delightful. So um, I think that's a good place for us to end it. I want to say thank you again um, to Coach Mike. We can give him a, a round of virtual applause. Yay. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. It's been uh, so interesting to see you and, and hear your comments and, and your questions. Uh, it's helping us all learn more and uh, just getting to know Cambridge all that much better. Thank well, you, you know what? You know what's made tonight so special is just seeing so many young folks, Louise and Louise as well, I believe Barbara, Marnie, Okay, all, all, you know, just the fact, I don't know what I was expecting or who I was expecting to be in this room with tonight, but it's more than I would have anticipated. And I hope, Louise, Ambler, that I didn't bore you or put you to sleep because I was, I, I've looked at you and I've looked at Louise and Bob, and as I look at, at the folks there, I have a tendency to, you know, I just know how important my mom was to me and how proud she was of her son. She thought that everybody in the world should have known, should know who her son was. And we would travel wherever we went. She'd say, you know my son, the coach? And I'd say, mom, they, don't, they, have, no, they, they have no idea who I am. But so I, I thank you, especially, you know, uh, uh, the folks that maybe have got a little bit more experience than the others for being on the call. So thank you. And uh, if ever, if ever you you know you run out of people, call me again. I'd love to come back on again another time. Maybe it'll be after I write the next book. Okay. Perfect. That's a perfect time. Thank, thank you again, you. Coach, and thank you again to everyone. Thanks, everybody. Great seeing you, Vinny. See you next time. See ya. Bye bye.